My name is Karen Cooney. I run the Viralist Center for Art and Politics. And for many, many years, we've had the pleasure of working with the Public Art Fund in bringing um, exceptional and outstanding artists to the new school. Today, we do so again, and we bring um, living and no longer living artists. Um, uh, Rob Pruitt's work is on view at uh, Union Square, and the work, as you may know, and probably you've already seen it, is called the Andy Monument, Andy being Andy Warhol. The whole program is called Andy Touched Me, and of course we, like many other institutions and organizations, have been touched by him. On the sixth floor of this building is a, one of his uh, Mao silk screen prints that entered the collection many years ago through the generosity of Vera List. Um, without further ado, I'd like to thank the panelists for being here, and I'd like to acknowledge Nicholas Baum, the chief curator of the Public Art Fund, who is now going to present the whole uh, evening and the concept of the evening. So thank you very much for coming. Hi, thank you so much, Karen. Always wonderful to be here at the New School, and thanks to you and Pam and your team for getting us so wonderfully uh, accommodated here. I also want to thank and acknowledge uh, the many individuals who help us to make this series possible and also the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. The season's talk series, New York, um, New York Stories, uh, as Karen mentioned, is about looking back at radical practices from the 1960s and looking at their continued resonance today. We heard in February from Lynn Cook and Douglas Crimp, who talked about their exhibition, Mixed Use Manhattan. But tonight's conversation, Andy Touched Me, is inspired, as Karen mentioned, by Rob Pruitt's latest project, uh, commissioned by Public Art Fund. It's the Andy Monument at the corner of Broadway and 17th Street, outside Andy's old factory, if by some chance you haven't already seen it. Uh, and it's, it's there. Um, for several months, and uh, some people have even suggested it should stay longer. We're absolutely delighted um, and thankful to those friends and supporters of Public Art Fund who've helped to make the monument possible. That's Con Edison, Rebecca and Marty Eisenberg, Catherine Farley and Jerry Spire, and Holly and Jonathan Lipton. And as well, we had the terrific support and collaboration of Gavin Brown, uh, and his team, the Union Square Partnership, Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York City Department of Transportation. So our program tonight is uh, just to give you a quick sketch of how things are gonna work. Rob is going to kind of kick off proceedings and give a brief introduction to the Andy Monument itself. Then we're gonna be joined um, as for a panel discussion, uh, which will ensue and then open up to audience questions time permitting. Um, the participants in our panel tonight, um, I'm excited to say, include um, Wayne Kirstenbaum, who is a poet and critic. He's a professor of English at the City University of New York's Graduate Center and a visiting professor at Yale University School of Art. His poetry collections include Model Homes, The Milk of Inquiry, and Ode to Anamofo, and other poems. He has written several collections um, of poetry and a novel, uh, as well as the nonfiction works Andy Warhol, which I think is my favorite biography of Warhol, uh, Cleavage, Jackie Under My Skin, <clears throat> The Queen's Throat, uh, and Double Talk. Wayne's latest book is a hybrid of fiction and nonfiction titled Hotel Theory, and his most recent poetry collection is best selling Jewish porn films. Upcoming works include Humiliation, to be published by Picador in August of this year. Uh, and The Anatomy of Harpo Marx to be published by uh, UC California Press next year. We're also, uh, I'm delighted to say, to be joined by Rhonda Lieberman. Uh, she's an artist and writer. Uh, she's taught in various MFA programs, including at Yale and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. 
Her essays appear in Art Forum, The Village Voice, and various anthologies. Her art has been shown in exhibitions uh, including the Fake Channel Show at Stocks Gallery, Bad Girls at the New Museum of Contemporary Art, and Too Jewish, Challenging Traditional Identities and Entertaining America, Jews, Movies, and Broadcasting at the Jewish Museum. Uh, but let us turn um, to Rob Pruitt, who will get us started. Rob's work is rooted, I think, in a pop sensibility uh, and a playful critique of art world structures. His conceptual projects have included performance-based artworks like his recent art awards presented at the Guggenheim Museum over the past couple of years and modeled after Hollywood awards ceremonies, as well as simple gestures that promote possibilities for creativity in everyday life as demonstrated in the series 101 Art Ideas You Can Do Yourself. From his glittering paintings of panda bears and sculptural formations of blue jeans to his flea markets, Pruitt's work is always characterized by an incisive humor and exuberant visual flair. In New York City, he's represented by Gavin Brown's Enterprise, uh, where his most recent e exhibition dealt with the very topical subject of bed bugs. Please welcome Rob Pruitt. Thank you, Nicholas, and uh, welcome everyone, and thank you for coming. So this is a little run through of images of basically how I uh, produced the Andy Monument. Uh, this is it finished. Can we have the next one? Um, this is the very first rendering, which I did not do myself. I um, was really, it was <clears throat> at the end of the summer and the Public Art Fund was hoping to have a, uh, something concrete to look at for what uh, it might look like. And so I hired um, a student to do this, which was very lazy of me. And uh, there are many things about it that I don't like, like the flared jeans and the uh, slouch-shouldered jacket, but I think it was sufficient to get the idea across. Um, next image. And then this is where I really stepped in and infused uh, my own ideas. I left the students rendering behind and I cast uh, one of my very best friends, Andy Stillpass, to pose for Andy Warhol. I've known Andy still pass for like 20 years. He's an art collector from Cincinnati and um, he owned a Honda dealership and it just always mystified me that this person could live in the middle of the country and have such a keen understanding of uh, what was new and going on and vital in the New York City art scene from so far away and he collected a few things of mine, and I was invited to visit his home and was just flabbergasted by the uh, installation. He really incorporates all of the uh, work that he collects into his uh, family's home and their living situation. Like there's this brilliant Karen Kalimnik uh, installation at the kitchen door, a uh, recreation of the Manson family murders from uh, the late 60s, and there's blood splattered on the kitchen door, and it says, death to piggies, and, um, and this is where they raised their beautiful little girl, Zoe, and had breakfast every morning, and um, uh, it, uh, just witnessing how they lived with art, um, further made me fall in love with him. Um, so anyway, there, he, he sort of holds this kind of, he's sort of my Warhol surrogate. Like uh, he isn't an artist himself, but his passion and his insight into art is just very gentle and very all knowing. And I never knew Andy Warhol, even though I developed this closeness and fondness for him from my early youth. I wanted to be able to put, um, infuse the monument with 
um, like a personal love uh, of my own. And so by casting Andy Stillpass to play Andy, I was able to do that. And I never thought at that moment that I would tell people that that's what I had done. It was just sort of my own, a way for myself to leverage some enthusiasm and some passion to make the figure as alive as I possibly could. Um, so that's Andy Stillpass, all dressed up as Andy Warhol, about to be laser scanned 360. And um, I thought it was very funny that day, because obviously he's a very slim man. I kept telling him to hold in his gut. But um, he didn't laugh. I think he thought that, uh, I thought it was funny, because I obviously have this big beer gut. And uh, since he's so slim, I thought that he would see the joke, but he didn't laugh. And I think I just hurt his feelings. Um, so these are the results of the digital laser scan. <clears throat> I never intended to use Andy Stillpass's face. I worked from photographs of Andy Warhol uh, to render the face, but the body is Andy Stillpass's. And I have included a Polaroid camera around um, Andy Warhol's neck because I was thinking that it would be a little more generous. Like not everyone that passes this monument is necessarily going to know who Andy Warhol is. So I thought it would be a nice point of entry. Like if you didn't know who Andy Warhol was, is you would at least know that this person is a picture maker or somebody or an artist. And then I included the uh, shopping bag because uh, besides being uh, a brilliant artist, aesthete. I think of Andy Warhol uh, as the ultimate consumer. You know, this uh, fantastic appetite that just gobbled up the world that he lived in and reinterpreted it back to us as artworks. Um, that's, I don't know what that is, it's a mold. <laughs> uh, this is it. Uh, turned into plaster, oh, I see, from the mold, and then I was able to go back and uh, fine-tune some of the um, particulars with, a, with a, you know, knives and uh, sandpaper. Um, but can we go back one? Um, since it was all done digitally, and I wish that I had an image to show you. The, the face at one point, like three steps before this, was much more articulated. Like you could really see uh, Andy's uh, kind of skeletal face, like sunken cheekbones and uh, wrinkles. And that just didn't feel right to me because I, I, I was in love with this uh, thing that he did of, uh, plastic surgery in regards to the commission portraits when he would make chubby people or unattractive people look as good as they could possibly look. And so I wanted to uh, give him the same treatment. And so the whole sculpture was run through, um, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, like a melting feature, uh, almost like as if, if it had been a popsicle or a, a lollipop, like, uh, it had been, you know, licked at or melted away. Um, and um, I thought it was a big success. But then when it got to the park, and I still think it's a big success, um, I overheard within a few minutes of it being put there, uh, there was a rather snarky woman who walked by and she said, oh my God, why is there a monument to Rachel Maddow? And I was like, it's, it was sort of the first comment about uh, the sculpture, besides my inner circle, you know, the people that I work with at the gallery and the artists that I'm friends with that I had shown like some prelims to, um, the first outside critique of it. And so uh, as, as I am want to be prone to uh, self-doubt, I, I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? The unveiling is tomorrow. Maybe it's not too late to say that it's Rachel Maddow. <laughs> I do love Rachel Maddow, but um, 
now that it, it has it has been there and her her comment has been del diluted by many more comments that were more positive um, I'm pleased with that decision that I made to sort of wash away the features and have um, um, Oh, and then someone in the press uh, said that it looked like Harry Potter. So um, now, actually, it's kind of hard for me to look at it without thinking about Harry Potter and Rachel Maddow. Um, what I, oh, and this might be the last slide. I'm really nervous, can you guys tell? Oh, good. <laughs> um, I wanted to start this whole little shebang, this introduction, by saying that when the whole proposition was before me of making a, a piece of public art, I didn't want to just produce some aesthetic flight of fancy. Like I, 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 I tend to be a very practical-minded person, and even when I'm making a painting or just something that's for a gallery show, the, there's an element of necessity or, a pra or practicality. And so I, I started by thinking, what is missing in the city? What, would, what, what kind of public work would um, serve the people and fill a void? And um, that's basically how I came up with the idea for an Andy monument. I, I really like that, um, that he's somebody who encouraged me as a young adult to move to New York City and fulfill my dreams. And I think that he serves that purpose for many other people. So to mark this sacred ground, which had been his studio in the 1970s, um, seemed like a useful thing to do, rather than just make something that was pretty. So there I am unveiling it. And it has a chrome surface, which I sort of decided on at the very last moment. I mean, there are obvious uh, reasons within Warhol's iconography to think about the image being chrome. Uh, his first studio in the 1960s was covered in aluminum foil. And there's this reference to uh, celebrities of the silver screen and um, that he is a mirror of his uh, time. But I think, as a confession to you guys, I thought that if I were to make it in mirror, any uh, sculptural flaws would be harder to decipher or to just determine uh, when you stood in front of it. Um, Isn't it great? <laughs> well, I think that that might be all I have to say for right now. But um, I think we should proceed with the panel. Uh, is that OK? Mike, is that all? Yeah, great. Um, Rob, thanks for the, the very candid uh, introduction. What we're going to do, I think, to um, sort of move into this phase of the conversation is uh, take the idea of, um, of how Andy touched us, uh, perhaps something that everyone can think about for themselves, uh, and I'll kick things off with a few remarks myself. Um, and as we're talking, there's just a kind of um, fairly random assortment of Warhol images that we'll just sort of scroll through um, as we talk. I grew up in Sydney, Australia, where mostly I knew Andy Warhol's work through reputation and reproduction. There really wasn't much in the way of Warhol exhibitions down under. That reputation was really quite low when I was at college 
uh, in Sydney and later even as an intern at MoMA in the 1980s. In fact, I recall a conversation with a friend at MoMA in 1998 who lamented Andy's untimely death, saying that he was really on the verge of a new era of creative brilliance. We'll never know that, but it surprised me since I had bought the left-leaning academic view that Andy had sold out in the 1970s and been inconsequential ever after, a view that was then shared by many more conservative observers as well. It wasn't until 1994 that Warhol's first major museum exhibition in Australia took place at the newly opened Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, where I was by then a junior curator. I somehow landed responsibility for the traveling show Andy Warhol Portraits. And by that time, scholars such as Ken Silver and Richard Meyer had begun to understand and interpret Andy's work in relation to his sexuality, which had been pretty thoroughly repressed and ignored by Warhol's scholarship and curating until then. As a young gay curator in Sydney, Andy touched me and I understood more profoundly that his work was still relevant and still politically charged, and also that it had to be rescued from the willful ignorance of an art history uncomfortable with sexuality, particularly of the queer kind. I wound up moving to the United States and became curator at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, um, where the first large-scale show that I did there was called about face Andy Warhol portraits, among the first Warhol exhibitions to integrate the multiple strands of his work within an expanded notion of portraiture. Isn't a shoe called Zaza Gabor a portrait? Or a film called Blowjob that focuses exclusively on the face of its subject? When I heard from Gavin Brown that Rob wanted to do a traditional statue of Andy Warhol I first thought, what a brilliant idea. Then I wondered how an old-fashioned statue could do justice to such a radical artist. And I think Rob has shown us exactly how with the Andy Monument, his glistening, hollow statue with the nose job Andy always dreamed of, plated in chrome, the shiniest and shallowest of all the metals. It was during that Hartford show that I had the pleasure of first meeting Wayne Kirstenbaum. Wayne uh, came up to Hartford to talk about Taylor Maid's ass and to screen this little known masterpiece of Warhol cinema. Wayne, how did Andy touch you? <laughs> Thank you, Nicholas. You've touched me in many ways. So. That's great. Curatorially, I mean, that's a great opening. Okay, <laughs> let's move on. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read something so I don't stumble. But um, I want to just say that Andy changed obviously the way we. He not only made um, more brilliant artworks than anyone can even hold in one physical space or one country practically, but he reform reformatted the way we think about six and more crucial categories, and here they are. One, garbage. Two, sex. Three, publicity. Four, relatedness or community. Five, saving and collecting. Six, working versus ease. Um, one sentence, perhaps, about each of those. Um, if one of the 20th century's um, contributions to art has been the revaluation of garbage, Andy did it with more pizzazz than anyone. Sex, he showed in all of his work that sex wasn't merely about visualizable sex acts, but about a penumbra of longing that informs the entire act of looking at anything, to look to gaze for Andy Warhol and for us as inheritors was uh, to yearn for sex. Three, publicity. Um, publicity for Andy and now for us is not just an adjunct to art, but perhaps art's central goal. 
for relatedness. Um, Andy didn't like to be touched, actually. So it's funny that this is called Andy. I mean, he had, I think there's even a name for that kind of phobia of not wanting to be touched. But he, the, the very way that human beings collaborate and work together as cells or communities was one of the projects of Andy's work. Five, saving and collecting, and this what went into his bag. Um, he saved and collected the objects and categories of the world and reformatted them into artworks that he knew would be there, therefore the world's nightmare to catalog and to hold. He was a hoarder. And, and um, finally, working and ease. He made art seem easy, and he valued easy art, but he worked every day with an indefatigability and a assiduousness that puts him in the company of John Milton um, and other workaholics. So here, more formally, but briefly, is a, a little thing I wrote called My Warhol. Warhol cheers me up about getting bad reviews. Lousy press didn't stop him. So Andy is my role model for the shat upon artist who bucks up despite harsh criticism and continues to produce. Being unlikable was his endeavor's foundation. Warhol cheers me up about never transcending kindergarten, never shedding infantile fascinations. Often my brain can't accommodate what it receives. Informational glut shuts down my main frame. Warhol processed perceptions in a peculiar way. He listed, atomized, cut, reformatted, and hybridized the angry corpuscles of fact that streamed into his system. His example helps me believe that no matter how elementary or convoluted my aesthetic method may seem, I am stuck with it. And so the choice is either to kill myself or to practice patiently my flawed mode. Warhol cheers me up about constant horniness, call it constitutive prurience or permanently dirty mind. Warhol may, never, may not have gotten a lot of sex, has this ever been factually established, but he certainly squeezed in a lot of sexual scoping. Warhol cheers me up about living adjacent to insanity or retaining a pipeline to altered cognitive styles. His behavioral peculiarities, his attraction to odd people, and his ready transformation of acting out into art show how invigorating, if potentially lethal, it can be to embrace what Deleuze and Guattari nearly prescribe in anti-Oedipus as a ludic schizophrenia, a madness that might be good for you. Warhol cheers me up about family and its absence and antidotes. Opt out of the nuclear family or convert it into the factory. Live with your mother as long as you please and forget public verdicts on your backward menage. Warhol rethought the meaning of ensemble. His novel practices of entourage, collaboration, isolation, and twinship give salty pointers in collective and solitary misbehavior parables akin to games people play, Sondheim's company, and the New Testament. Last paragraph. Warhol cheers me, out, cheers me up about difficulty. Though sometimes simple-minded, I am drawn to obdurate, complicated art. Indeed, Warhol's opacity and polyvocality have led me to nominate difficulty as my aesthetic compass. Warhol sends me into Derrida's arms. Without Warhol, I would never have sat through all of Fassbinder's Berlin Alexander plots. Without Warhol, I might not have appreciated Cage and Boulez, and without them, I would have never backtracked to Schoenberg, who seems Warhol's antithesis, but is in fact his compatriot in the art of being odd. See Schoenberg's essay, How One Becomes Lonely. Warhol has taught me patience and thereby changed the way I consume music, literature, and art. Trained by Andy, I no longer demand instant digestion. All I want is boredom, a turgidity I can turn inside out to find its erotic silver lining inscribed with love from A.W.
Um, of all of us sitting up here, I'm the one Andy would be least likely to touch. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> if he touched anyone. But we know he liked to look. Nevertheless, as a young pop-obsessed weenie, I devoured everything I could read about Warhol in the school library, where I learned to confuse post-war aesthetics with gossip. The diaries, the philosophy, popism, the oral histories. I couldn't get enough pop dish. My favorite chapter in the philosophy of Andy Warhol is Underwear Power, where the popster gives a blow-by-blow -blow account of shopping for undies at Macy's. It begins, buying is much more American than thinking, and I'm as American as they come. It feels taboo, un-American, even Jewish, to think about Andy Warhol. To actually read his work is an unpop thing to do. Gobbling some of the juicy Warhol archive, I was struck that so many of the factory people were Catholic, a church of fame with its emphasis on pageantry, celebrities like Jesus and Madonna, relics like autographs, taboos, and the confessional, like the tape recorder or camera Warhol demanded his superstars to entertain in exchange for the salvation of stardom. Bob Colicello, in an early review of Trash, declared it a Catholic masterpiece and got himself hired at interview. If you want to know all about Andy Warhol, he said, Andy, that is. Just look at the surface, and there I am. There's nothing behind it. That was his shtick, and he stuck to it in the press, which made it all the more fun to peek behind the scenery in the copious documentation the factory churned out along with the images. The mania for documentation anticipating the compulsive status updates of Facebook superstars in dire need of attention today. Producing by reproducing, the factory cranked out media-created superstars in a profoundly shallow world, ours, that confused identity and image, original and copy. Warhol vampirized everything from Jackie's to soup cans into Warhol's in a now familiar orgy of branding where star and voyeur, name and nobody became one. Forty years later, Warhol is still the fascinating black hole of fabulosity. I'm a receiver, he told Charles Henry Ford, who flattened the difference between art and life and people who are on the scene still bask in his cult of fame and his weirdly contagious vision, which can seemingly transmute anything, however banal or freakish, into pop. Photos of the famed celebraholic reveal his tics. We see him as a tot in a photo booth, the machine, as ingenue posing garbo-like among pansies, the fairy, as bewigged factory auteur among, among hench freaks, the superstar, as replicated by Warhol lookalikes, identity issues, and as torso seamed with Frankensteinian scars from the botched assassination, celebrity equals death. One is struck by the disparity between Warhol's image obsession and the lamentable raw material he was saddled with, between his media machine glamour fantasy and the body that defies aesthetic mastery. Wayne Kastenbaum's wonderful portrait probes the trauma of Warhol. Traumas are notoriously repeated rather than digested. Instead of processing emotion, Warhol's work is escape from emotion, escape from the self, pop as anesthesia. A cat's death, Wayne wrote, was the trauma that fashioned him into a cold and legitimate artist. Yes, Warhol was a cat lady in the 50s with more than 20 kitties. Wayne cites a striking passage when Andy told his, the diary on September 16, 1980, quote, my darling Hester, she went to pussy heaven and I felt guilty ever since. That's how I should have started popism. That's when I gave up caring. Self-expression was for the superstars he taped, filmed, and enabled. While the artist tried to remove himself from the work, famously removing his hand via his mechanical process, the use of assistance, and other surrogates, he demanded the collaboration of the other, even codependents. The artist as fame enabler and vampire required a supply of performer victims whose exhibitionism he anointed with an aura of stardom. His self-portraits depict an alien. Reflecting undead superstars, fame and nothingness, Warhol's look is uncannily corpse-like. In one shot, he's a lumpy-faced wreck in a duet with his own shadow. In self-portrait and drag, his bushy white eyebrows show fuzzily under carefully drawn-on glamour arches. In Self-Portrait, 1979, a large format Polaroid pitilessly bears his mottled skin in a strangely candid-seeming close-up. His gaze, his gaze seems to mirror our own as he mouths an expression of, of distaste at what he sees. 
Yet just a few years later, Warhol would title down runways as a professional Zoli model. Finally living his working girl fantasy, he looks moribund. His self-portrait paintings and camouflage and black on black are great looking icons, redeeming black flesh through extreme stylization. Warhol's mass production exalted wannabes and steadily deflated somebodies. He demonstrated how fame makes a Liz equal a soup can equal a car crash. The bold-faced name junkie was also an iconoclast. Exposure dilutes as well as trumpets the star's specialness. He liked things to be bad. He liked things to be boring. He lived for product endorsements. He liked to show the complicity between glamour and nothingness, originals and copies. His, his entire oeuvre asks us, what's the difference between real and fake glamour? And he would probably say nothing. That's it. <laughs> My oh, turn again. Your turn. <laughs> I have learned something already tonight. You're supposed to write something and then read it. I didn't know that. <laughs> you can't count on your wits. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I'm going to do that. Because you guys are both so, you're so smart. And that was so beautiful, both of you. And Nicholas, that was very, yours was very nice too. <laughs> um, Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Um, well, since I didn't write anything, I, have, I just have these ideas that are coming to me, and hopefully they'll come quickly. Um, and the first one that's coming to me is that sometimes you don't, or I don't, <clears throat> know that I've done a good job until it's all done, and then somebody puts it into their own words uh, to my face at, say, a party. And this happened at the unveiling of the Andy Monument. Susan Friedman, who, what is her position? She's president of Public Art Fund. Oh, the Art president Fund. of the Public Art Fund, um, was congratulating me uh, at the opening, unveiling. And she said, the thing that I adore about the Andy Monument is that it is the perfect bookend to the Statue of Liberty you know, who welcomes immigrants. The, this is welcoming the disenfranchised and the drag queens Glamour and the, all. yeah. Thanks. And I thought, my God, I am a genius. <laughs> 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 um, and so I, I, until I revealed to you guys tonight, I had, been, I had been using that as my own statement that I designed it to be a bookend to the yeah. Statue of Liberty. <laughs> but it feels good to confess that it was really Susan Friedman who told me that. Um, having made an Andy monument or an Andy Warhol or a monument to Andy Warhol, you would think that I'm just totally obsessed with Andy Warhol's work. And I think it's fine. I, I really even like a lot of it, but um, if the truth be told, I like, um, like an Agnes Martin painting or a Donald Judd sculpture even more because it just seems so perverse. You know, like it, it's not really offering that much. Andy had such a, a generosity that it just seems so <coughs> obvious. Or it's more like the air that we breathe. Like right. I think every person who thought about art <clears throat> ever since Warhol has been permeated by his, um, exactly. his sensibility. We take it or leave it, but it's just so. Also, an Agnes Martin gets a more Agnes Martin look in a world that has Andy Warhol. So one could, in Warhol's, Warhol touched, even with even if you don't want to be next to Warhol, you're next to him. Right. I mean, this isn't just to rebut your love of Agnes Martin more, but that there is a weird way. Aggie. That, Aggie. Aggie. <laughs> there is a weird way that other people's seriousness can read next to Warhol's, mm -hmm. you know, triviality. But my real love for Andy Warhol is sort of about um, giving a very young and thin and good-looking Rob Pruitt some direction in life. When I was a, a teenager in high school, you know, sort of friendless and very gay acting <laughs> and being picked on, you look, you look for um, a role model. And I was, you know, fortunate enough to go directly to Andy. I don't even know how it happened, except for that when I was much younger, 
I was born to very young parents. I think my parents were just like 16 years old when I was born, so they were kind of like kids raising kids. And my mom had a soup can poster from the poster shop hanging over our couch. Yeah. So he was in my consciousness from a very young age. Um, but it wasn't until the 70s when I was in junior high and high school an interview came out that I started reading about his position not as an artist, but in pop culture at large, you know, like going to Studio 54 and being friends with Calvin Klein and Bianca Jagger and Liza Minnelli, that I really started to see him as a role model because that, I thought, could be my future life. Oh, I can move to New York and um, go clubbing and, and go to great parties. Um, and, um, oh, I don't really have a next point. <laughs> um, but you did move to New York. Yes, I did move to New York. And you did meet And I'm too tired Andy. to go to club. Oh, yes, 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 I, thank you. <laughs> You're feeding me a point because we've been in dialogue for so many months. Um, so I, 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 I graduated high school and I moved to New York to go to uh, Parsons School of Art. And... Um, in a very naive way, I thought to myself, I don't need to live in the school dorm, I'm gonna live in the Chelsea Hotel, and so I went to the Chelsea Hotel, mm -hmm. and I got a room for $200 a month, and I, my parents said that they would pay the tuition if I covered my expenses, so the first thing I did was I marched right over to the studio, which is a few feet from where the monument is now positioned, and I rang the buzzer, and I was a loud up and within a matter of like four minutes and I was there with a very good friend um, I was ushered into Andy Warhol's office and I thought oh my god my life is just it's so easy peasy everything <laughs> is just going as planned and um, he was very nice to me and he asked me what well, the first question was he asked me what my previous job experience was and I said well I've only had one job working at the haagen ice cream store in Washington DC and he shouted through the wall to the office next door hey Bridget I'm interviewing this guy who says that he can get us as much free haagen as we can eat. <laughs> and of course I didn't say that I could get free haagen I was just scooping ice cream for like two fifty an hour. And um, he gave me the job, um, but I, I didn't take it because it was an internship and I didn't know what an internship was. I just thought I had a job with no salary they and he was screwing me. They started sweeping the floors at the factory, didn't they? Like all of yeah, like right. He and... may have mentioned sweeping the floors, yeah. but the thing that I walked away remembering to this day was that I had a job, but no salary was going to be attached to it. Um, so instead, which is not really part of this discussion, I got a job at Macy's and um, in the glove department. And within a week, I had sold gloves to Prince, from many, you know, and um, Leroy Neiman. Um, and then I was fired for some reason, I don't remember why, but uh, that was sort of my first and only encounter face-to-face -face with Andy Warhol. But he was very kind, as I remember, and I um, should have taken that job, <laughs> or maybe Well, not. you did, I mean, in a way, the, talk about the bookends, your, the job offered from Andy and the job accepted as in the glove compartment at Macy's have a beautiful parallelism. Mm, yeah. Well, I think Andy liked to get paid, so he would have understood you were yeah. a kindred spirit. I don't think he would have worked for free. <laughs> so does someone want to take the baton, or do I have to <laughs> well, say... Also, just I must say, but not to play with the gloves too much, but if Andy didn't like to touch, the oh, glove right. would be the thing that would prevent the touch. So that's even another thing. <laughs> he, if he really didn't like being touched, he, his effigy right now you know, he might be rolling in his grave because he's getting so much love and affection mm -hmm. on Union Square. Um, it's actually, it's, it's extraordinary to me that that sculpture of Rob's has this effect on people that it's almost sort of impossible to look at it without smiling. Mm -hmm. Rachel it's Maddow very will do that. joyful. <laughs> she, she, she has that effect. I mean, why do you think... Why do, you think War why do you think people gaze upon Warhol's image and are delighted in such a kind of spontaneous... There was a certain kind of like 
um, media gag joke thing. Like he really did kind of penetrate popular culture outside the art world. And there was always like the sense of, is he a put on or not? Like in just in the most vulgar sense, you know, I think people who are not art people would know of him and know, oh, he's a great prankster or he's kind of playing some kind of joke that we kind of get, but we're not quite sure what it is. But this guy is obviously sending up commercial culture and celebrity culture. So I think people are kind of like smiling even, well, for, I don't know exactly why they're smiling, but there's, he circulated as a kind of like, you know, in, inside joke of some sort that no one was really sure of. Mm. So. He also made standing next to a, an art practice, standing, which is hence my point about Agnes Martin, that Andy spent a lot of time being next to other institutions and celebrities, and he changed the meaning of anything he stood next to. And he, you know, he's, uh, Andy next to Liz changes Liz and changes Andy, or, you know, adjacency was one of his tricks, and it was his, one of his, his but media. But like fame attracts fame. Like so he I, amplified his fame with other people's fame, and he started off as a kind of star, starry eyed fan and star fucker, and he just kind of multiplied his, his fame by, by contiguity, like a water molecule, like, like all the fame board. molecules just kind of like glomming together. And that having the statue there for other, it will become a posing object for other people to practice adjacency to. So right. now it's, he's newly available for the, the photo opportunities and for upping other people's um, fame wattage. And also Rob by kind of, um, Glomming with Warhol becomes part of the whole like chain of Warhol fame. Um, it's got a hitch effect. in your wagon. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it's very Warhol to do that. It's kind of like this um, hologram, you know. It, of course, there's um, there's continually new generations uh, who are also learning about Warhol. Um, I I think the first day the sculpture was up. We'd just sort of done the installation and a mother with her young kids was crossing the road and she saw the piece and sort of let out this squeal of delight saying, wow, that is fantastic. And the kids were like, what, what, who, who is this? And the mom was like, ah, you morons, it's Andy Warhol. <laughs> um, just that, that sense of, um, maybe it's that inside kind of joke as well, I think Rob's managed to kind of build into his homage and, and that idea of um, the kind of, uh, you know, the hollowness of the piece and its reflectiveness and... Um, I've made a piece for mean mothers. <laughs> <laughs> to make their kids feel un uncool. There was also, at Warhol, um, one of his last um, art performances was, I think, at Area, the nightclub, where he was a, a living sculpture. Of one, himself. Of himself just standing there and you're eerily recreating wow. that. And he was very, I think, in, in the, at the end of his life, he records this in the diary, was like going to autopsy. Th I mean, like, some, whatever, like, art students can go to morgues to sketch or whatever. He was doing some kind of stuff like that because he, he, he was wanting to work on life casts. Mm. Well, I think he yeah. wanted to sell his portrait, um, his society portrait clients another piece. So he was looking into having um, busts machine yeah. made so he could kind of make another sale to his, um, his victims, mm. as he called them. A few, a few days ago, Glenn O'Brien... Um, said to me, <laughs> it's really funny, so I hope I can do it justice. He did a very good Warhol impersonation, so here goes mine. Gee, Glenn, look at how they made me so thin and good looking. I guess that means they must really think that I'm fat and ugly. <laughs> <laughs> because that's how he thought, maybe. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Rob, we've you know, sort of touched on, I think, the popular response to the piece and, and perhaps in, in some ways Warhol. Um, what about your artist friends and colleagues? I mean, what do you think? Um, Me? Yeah, I mean, what do you think this idea of, um, you know, kind of creating a monument to Warhol, how do you think that resonates, uh, obviously anecdotally, with other artists? 
I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I don't know. Um, Ron. Uh, well, I, I just, well, I could just say that it seems like it should have been there all along, and it's finally there. Like it, it seems like there was an inevitability to it because it's such a great idea to mark that site that's so important in 20th century art. I mean, mm -hmm. Wayne and I and Rob were saying earlier that. Well, when I walk around Union Square, I always think about it. It's like being in um, Athens and thinking about Socrates, you know? Like I walk in Union Square and think, this is where the factory was and where Warhol reported to work every day with his shopping, you know? Yeah. And it just feels like it's so, um, you did find something that was missing that, that should be there. I guess Maybe. I was remembering that you mentioned to me, I think, some emails you would had sort of from other artists that, were kind of responding to this oh, piece yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in a very different way, say, than you'd, you know, you'd experienced before. I'm gonna let you down, I don't really remember. <laughs> Just say it. <laughs> no, I think that was, it was your, your comment, I mean, the, oh. um, I think for the most part, um, people are into it. Um, well, I guess I the, the bigger question maybe is, is sort of going to Warhol's relevance right now. Um, I mean, are we sort of celebrating Warhol because he, he is this uber brand of, you know, kind of art, glamour, celebrity, um, and... And non-originality, too, embracing non-originality as a strength. I think that's one of the most radical things that he, he did. Like, like Duchamp chose to deem a ready-made a piece of art, and Warhol decided to deem being non-original as a plus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think it, that's a, just a huge, like a radical shift for, for me at least when thinking about 20th century art. I mean, I guess Duchamp was also into non-originality, but not, not as um, exhaustively as Warhol. There was something about copying and confusing real and fake things and But it's kind of, that. I mean, I always think it's, um, I mean, obviously, Warhol's work, and as you sort of argued, is yet incredibly original. Um, I mean, it's, or, right. or maybe it's sort of a rethinking of what, what it means to be original, that that right. can involve a sort of, you know, non-singular subjectivity and a kind of engagement with other people, other systems, other networks, um, and in that sense, of course, anticipates like a lot of what's going on today um, in, in sort of an interesting way. The feeling I get on the street or in the artist's studio of why Warhol is relevant today isn't really his, uh, his unoriginality or his originality, but it is his, in a way, being an, uh, like a, the ur outsider artist. Um, I mean, Duchamp may have set up a kind of ease of making at, at the beginning of the century, but he was, he worked pretty hard on his large glass, actually. Um, but um, Warhol um, was, a, was a, a commercial artist and he tiptoed into fine art with a lot of trepidation and a lot of, surrounded by a lot of condescension. Um, and the condescension surrounded him throughout his life and even a sense of, you know, is, is, he, is this really art? It doesn't, it's not hard enough, it's not, you know, it's, it's just copying. Um, then he entered movie making and he just, without technique, he just started doing it. Um, and I think that, so I, the feeling I get, even artists who don't literally take after Warhol or who don't deal with publicity as a trope are inspired and just enabled, whether they know it or not, by his, um, moving right into art without asking permission first, or even without being good at it. And this is not to say that Andy wasn't good at art. He had a very fine hand, as they say. But um, it's so true yeah. that people are, get so worried about being taken seriously or not, and Warhol struggled with not being taken seriously and being patronized by the kind of butch, real art with the capital A crowd. Or the smart people. I mean, right. the, you know, the, the endless sort of the, the, the festival of interlocution where s people like us would be interviewing Andy and we <laughs> and he would made it look be made silly. to seem stupid. Yeah, he made it look silly to be serious. Yeah, I all mean, of our ideas. Right. And he just would say, yeah, that's kind of... That's great. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one thing that I think about Warhol's relevancy is um, that because he had 
such a tremendous output of work that, and there are so many periods and so many projects that there's sort of an endless autopsy being done. And it's so, the, it's not about Warhol being relevant, it's about w which of his projects is now relevant. You right. know, like uh, it's time to re-examine the commission portraits of the 70s or maybe think about just the abstractions like the Piss paintings, but um, I don't know that there is something in the air at this moment about um, a newfound Warhol relevancy, but I think that um, people enjoy going back over the large body of work and finding like uh, lost hits, you know, right. and uh, shedding some light on those things. Well, it was even, of course, for a few years it was, it was like Warhol hadn't really died because mm -hmm. every season there'd be a new Warhol show of works that you never knew existed um, as, you know, the foundation kind of distributed distributed different works. The problem with, not the problem with Warhol, but the, 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 the stumbling block for Warhol that I certainly, I was not, a, before I wrote a biography of him, I didn't really care that much about him, but I gradually started to care more. And then when I started looking at the work carefully and thoroughly, completely fell in love with it, is that um, if you don't look s slowly at it, it can look like a postcard. Or it, it's easy, you know, Warhol um, benefits from very slow looking. I think he enforces it, actually. I think it's, I mean, obviously in something like Empire, he enforces it by the film lasting so long. But really, even any of his canvases impose on the ready viewer a kind of stillness and patience. As, as one-liner as they seem, they're really slow. And I, um, so that... I even feel like a certain kind of hesitation when I'm on a panel talking about Warhol's relevance. I realize I'm talking about Warhol as brand in a way, and and I want to recenter anything I say around um, not finally Warhol's aura or brand, but about this very um, unique and slow process of concentration that I think happens in front of Warhol's effects. The things are so beautiful, like um, the photo show at the ICP um, a few years ago, I was just so struck by how beautiful his pieces were, and it, but it gets eclipsed by his celebrity brand. Even the ones that are stitched together yeah, with that, the sewing yes. machine? Those are great. Yes. No, I hate those. Really? <laughs> that's so funny. Like, yeah, I, mean, I don't know why. Well, that's the I can't articulate it. You know, it's so funny. Much. At first, I thought it seemed like really pat, but then uh -huh. when I think about the stitches, it reminds me of the sutures and mm. skin, skin being sewn yeah. up, and mm. it just yeah. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but then it creates a rhythm too, like the four pho uh, photos stitched together create this kind of Jackson Pollock um, effect, just mm -hmm. because they naturally create a rhythm, right. and it's easy, easy Pollock, <laughs> a quickie Pollock. I mean, just to to sort of go back to this sort of question of, of Warhol's influence, even perhaps if like now is not a particular sort of moment of resurgence. Um, clearly over the last 20 years, there's been a huge sort of revaluation of, of Warhol as an artist from this kind of low ebb um, in his reputation as kind of the sellout, mm -hmm. the you know, just obsessed with uh, celebrities and not making serious art. Um, you know, to a point now where you, you can argue that it's very hard to even, you know, consider making art without dealing with Warhol on some or feel, level. Or feeling enabled by him, you know. Right. Um, and it's, it's sort of striking to me that the artists who... Um, one can associate with Warhol uh, are so different in, in what they do. I mean, I think the, there are artists who maybe um, this idea of sort of Warhol and branding um, that one thinks of immediately and that have often been associated with him, maybe like Jeff Koons um, or Murakami, where it's about looking also at this kind of diffusion into the world, you know, through non traditional art making, 
means. But then, you know, an artist like Thomas Hirschhorn, you know, has sort of a very interesting relationship to Warhol as well, where I think the scale of that ambition is somehow really about like being an incredibly public artist. And, you know, any artist who wants their work to communicate with that, the sort of directness that you were talking about, Wayne, of not waiting for permission and sort of wanting to get into the public sphere in this sort of, with this immediacy. And um, I mean, that seems like, you know, an, an incredibly powerful model that, that so many artists take. Um, I also think in a, in, a, in a funny way for me, the, the eclipse of Warhol during the last 20 years of his life when he was in his bad, unvalued period becomes a kind of object lesson for us now so that um, for all the, the, the glamour and excitement of coming to New York and making it an Andy Warhol as a kind of uh, success story, there's a lot of uh, abasement, abjection, pathos, grime in living in New York, being an artist in New York, being unrecognized, which is the fate of most artists. I mean, there's a, a kind of bottoming out that is really basic to art, despite the Sotheby's Christie, et cetera. I mean, despite the market inflation of art, art as it's practiced is not famous, uh, not empowered, trashed. And so I think that Warhol, though he seems to represent the summit of commercial success and uh, now old master acclaim, uh, always reminds me at least of the kind of seamy, um, you know, the sadness that is basic, the sadness and the not being seen that is basic to art. In some way, one could say, was Andy Warhol ever really seen? Um, he seems so seen, but uh, there's, a, there's a way that he too remained in eclipse. Well, especially if you read, you know, his diaries and you read the oral histories and memoirs, you know, I mean, which you're very tuned into, you know that his personal experience was um, very fraught and mm -hmm. insecure, and he was um, quick to come out with his nervousness and everything. But there was this constant hustle that comes through when you read all of these accounts. That he was just like even into his actual experience, he was pretty abject. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting. I just saw the Linda Bankless show at um, at the New Museum, and. It would be interesting for, you know, she had that famous controversial thing in art form, which was a very Warhol kind of act of using a magazine for, uh, to stage a performative assault on canons of taste or whatever. And, and it, it would be, you know, she is in a way an artist who seems to be more in the Agnes Martin sphere. Formalist. I mean, yeah, a formalist, serious. I mean, deeply playful, but I mean, you know, I think that um, I'm just was suddenly remembering that audacious. She wanted act to take out an ad of herself, I think, um, nude with a dildo. Is that it? Yeah. And it was created. People were fainting and clutching their pearls and completely freaking <laughs> out. And she was having fun with, you know, clutching pushing, their pushing, stocks. pushing, you know, a, a, a gender um, taboo. But she was scolded, and people completely freaked out about it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she, um, yes, I think that was a kind of Warhol prank to pull, but she was really um, kind of battered for it. Yeah, so why, why don't we um, uh, give people in the audience a chance to, uh, to ask questions if anyone has um, a question or a comment they'd like to make. I know we have um, a couple of people with um, with microphones, so uh, if you do have a question, um, just raise your hand. Is there? Yeah. Hi. Um, it's a, this is a question mostly for Rob, but it, it might extend to Warhol as well. It's about the degree to which the artist is motivated by the subject of their work. So I think an onlooker um, passing by the Andy Monument might think that, wow, this artist must have put so much time in and so much effort. They must really be motivated by Warhol, really love Warhol, but it seems in your comments that you might not be the biggest fan. 
And so really? I'm wondering what, um, you know, what is, what is your motivation for a project like this over that long time span? Um, well, maybe I was being a little bit flip with some of my comments, but I really do feel uh, that I'm living the life that I'm living today um, because of Andy Warhol. He was a guiding light that I found early in my youth. If I meant, if there was any truth in the flip comments about Warhol not being that important to me, it's that I don't really necessarily obsess on the works that he made in the 1960s, like his most iconic works, the Liz Taylors and the soup cans and the Brillo boxes. I think that they're quite good and, and deserve to be in the world's greatest museums, but I don't go to them for inspiration. Do you know what I mean? Uh, there's so much more there for me. I, you know, every year I find something else about Warhol to be motivated by, you know, as one of you was uh, just talking, I, my mind was wandering, not because what you were saying wasn't interesting, but I was thinking about how much I love the way he updated the way he looked for like the last seven years of his life. Like the glasses got bigger and the wig got young. bigger. Yeah, and the, the <laughs> he chewed gum so he would look he younger. He chewed gum and the le <laughs> leather jacket. He thought it younger. made him look younger. Makes your, it, it's like a facelift. <clears throat> well, it's just yeah, associated with being a <laughs> teenager. Um, I don't know. Did that I answer your question? I mean, I... I, I made a monument to something that changed my life that I really do love. Um, I'm sorry if I took the conversation in a direction to make you think otherwise. I was probably trying to be funny and it failed slightly. <laughs> but in a way, I think, I mean, I, I certainly feel the same way in the sense that I didn't think you have to love everything Warhol did. I mean, he was so prolific. Um, it would almost be astonishing if one did, but at the same time, to understand that the strategies he developed um, were so brilliant uh, and so effective that they give artists, and I mean, not just visual artists, I mean, writers, uh, filmmakers. Right. I also see uh, the Warhol Monument as a more designers. general, as a monument to artists at this particular version though happens to be Andy Warhol, but it's to balance out all of the army generals and former mayors and... Um, I think we should have <laughs> Liza Minnelli next. <laughs> I think, isn't there a statue of Gertrude Stein in, um, in Bryant Park? I think there should be some, some kind of meeting of the mm. Gertrude statue and your statue. Mm. Just like before it's taken down, just have them rendezvous. Or in the middle of the night, Gandhi Text and Warhol yeah. could walk slowly yeah. towards one another <laughs> and kiss and then return okay, we, to their stations. We have um, two questions, one over here and then over here. Oh, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, Rob Pruitt and Nicholas what the fate of the Andy Monument will be after October. Meaning, um, will it be in a public collection, will it go on tour? Or is it just seen as a temporal, site-specific work? I think the contract with the, the city and the park is through October. And I just prefer to take it one day at a time. You know, I, of course, I think it would be wonderful if it could stay, but I would only want it to stay if there was public demand for that. I don't think that you should force public art on a public that doesn't necessarily want it. I don't know about that, Rob. Oh, I think you should. As long as it doesn't kill anybody. I was trying to be modest. <laughs> Humble. No, but I really do feel that. I, I, I think that there's a lot of time to see how, to see if it becomes part of the fabric of the park and the city, and then that's a battle to fight for me if that is indeed the case. But otherwise, um, it will cool off in storage for a while. <laughs> But I think, you know, um, we, I think we were all just very focused on the realization of the statue and the project um, and kind of 
getting it up and running. And I think the fact that it's attracted such interest and is so successful then, you know, might lead to other opportunities. But that's all stuff that is just kind of to unfold. My friend Rachel Harrison said that she wanted to make a monument of Valerie Solanas pointing a gun <laughs> and put it right next to Andy Warhol, which is a little gruesome. But the, I just say that as to express the possibilities are possibly endless of what, <laughs> what might happen. The Bianca, I, Calvin Klein. Oh, right, yes. Um, yes. Done, um, Actually, that was my question also, because I live in the neighborhood and it People are loving it, and there's all generations sparking comments like kids finding out who Andy Warhol is. So I feel like a lot of our preciousness is in museums, and it would be great to have, you know, more access to the history of New York and art on the streets. So Thank you. Bravo Maybe, to you. Thank like, you. Maybe you could be the first signature on the petition. Send it to, my way. To, yeah. <laughs> By the way, that was the third location of the factory. Nothing. Right. But it's the Warhol that... Um, that well, I love the most. No, actually, he was shot on the west Oh, he was side. shot... 33. Uh, right, on the west side of the park. Right, 33 west. What is that building called? The, it's oh, just the 33 Garber? West. Decker um, building? The, the, the yeah, Decker building. Decker oh, well, that's building. a sidebar, but anyway, yeah. kudos to you. <laughs> no, it's good. Everyone well, should know that. Yeah. Um, okay, last um, question here. So we've got to... You made brief mention about how, um, that the idea for Andy came from you, but how did this whole process of um, uh, working with a public art fund and their impact on, uh, on you, how did, how did your dialogue and your dynamic work and what was the inspiration? Was there a request from the city or you went to the city with a, I've got a great idea, how did that all come about? It's not the first time that I've been asked that, and it's very hard for me to remember. It's almost like when you think to yourself, how did I end up sleeping with that person last week? <laughs> um, I did, in my spring cleaning of my studio, find um, a proposal that I wrote to the Public Art Fund 10 years ago, long before you arrived, suggesting the very same project to them, and it was mm. declined. Um, so it's just something that's been in my consciousness that um, I feel very free about mentioning whenever I possibly can and possibly when I was meeting you at um, some affair or another last spring, I, right after you introduced yourself as just taken uh, the helm of the Public Art Fund, I probably said, oh, I have this project. That, uh, and um, I don't know, what is your recollection? Yeah. Um no, I think I, I, yeah, I think I first heard about it from sort of a third party even, and then Gavin Brown sort of talked to me about it. So obviously it was something that you had talked to your friends and circle about, like apparently for 10 years. Um, I have a lot of ideas, and a lot of them are not good, but when I recognize that one is good, I don't let go of it. And so... Well, thank goodness you didn't. Um, <laughs> And then I, I think, I mean, a lot of things came together in a very fortuitous way. Um, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Warhol and think he's an incredible artist, and so it resonated with me on that level. I think Rob is a fantastic artist, and I also am very keen in the work of the Public Art Fund to give artists who may not even be known for doing public art opportunities to sort of extend their own practice and do things that are sort of interesting and challenging for them. Um, and then we kind of brought the idea to the um, Union Square uh, partnership and it, it just happened that they, the Department of Transportation had just created this new pedestrian plaza, um, you know, given sort of the changes to the traffic that they've been doing there. So suddenly, there was an empty space right outside the factory. So, I mean, it, it was just kind of like, this was the idea that whose time had come. Um, so everyone got behind it and, you know, it just, it really happened pretty fast. Yeah. So, well, um, thank you all for your participation and attention. Thank you, everybody, Rhonda, Wayne, Rob, Great to have you guys. Thank you so much.